Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Equilearn Virtual Roundtable, Creating Anti-Oppressive Spaces, Our Roles as Institutional Actors. We're excited to see everyone, and for the folks that are just joining, welcome. Uh, we're also excited to allow concentrated time for informal dialogue around a very important topic, anti-oppressive learning environments that are responsive to all in our school community. During today's Equilearn Virtual Roundtable, we will provide guidance and, and hopefully answer participants' questions related to considerations and practices for effectively supporting all students in our recognition and disruption of oppression. Please consider this time an informal space to share your thoughts and insights, leverage learning from, from other educators, practitioners, and stakeholders, and to ask questions. The agenda for today consists of a welcome. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of our time today on a roundtable discussion with our, with our guests that we're excited to announce here shortly, and a review of resources and wrap up. Uh, during today's roundtable, we align to the four commitments borrowed from our colleagues at the Pacific Education Group. First, to stay engaged when dealing about topics of anti-oppression, um, and moving towards social justice and anti-discrimination. We're gonna to broach topics that are at times difficult to discuss. So we wanna encourage you to stay engaged. Second, to experience discomfort. Third, to speak your truth. Again, this is a virtual round table and we wanna share and create a safe virtual space for uh, communicating our truth. And we also know when we communicate our truth, we enable and empower others to share the, theirs. We also want to receive uh, everyone's truth during the virtual roundtable as well. And finally, we are beginning this conversation in a virtual space, and so we want to expect and accept non-closure and not uh, anticipating that we would come to resolutions or closures, but continue to, again, have rich dialogue for uh, continued and long, um, um, lifelong learning towards realizing educational equity. Thank you, Tiffany. In addition, EcoLearn virtual roundtables are intended to be interactive. Participants are asked to interact in real time via our teleconferencing format. Also, to reduce uh, noise, we ask that all participants mute their microphone when not speaking. In addition, all hand handouts are accessible in the chat bar. Lastly, the video camera function has been turned on. Thus, if you have if you have a webcam and you would like to join, please feel free to join by clicking the camera icon at the lower left of your screen. Thanks, Jasur. I appreciate that. And again, just to underscore, if you have any tech issues, feel free to chat uh, in the box. Nick Pierce will be the assistant technical director. He's waving to you now. And for those who are not familiar with Zoom, you should see a scroll of people on your screen. You'll see an arrow that points to the right or the left and you can scroll through um, and to see the images of everyone who's joining us today. And so Nick is the assistant technical director. He can be supportive um, as well as Jasur Dapley, who's the lead technical director. Um, just so you know who all has been speaking to you thus far, my name is Tiffany Kaiser. I am the Associate Director of Engagement and Partnerships with the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. I'm joined by Jasor Dogley, who's the Instructional and Graphic Designer with the Center, and Nick Pierce, who's a Graduate Assistant with the Center. I'll be serving as your host today, Jasur as the Technical Director, and Nick as the Assistant Technical Director. Uh, in addition, I am so pleased and honored to introduce our roundtable guest speaker, Dr. Daniel Spikes. Uh, Dr. Spikes received his PhD in Educational Administration, specializing in Education Policy and Planning from the University of Texas at Austin, UT Austin. Prior to pursuing his doctoral degree, he worked for the Lufkin Independent School District in Lufkin, Texas, uh, as a middle school English language arts teacher and as a school administrator. He also served as an adjunct faculty member at Angelina Community College. While at UT Austin, he started as a graduate research assistant for the Neighborhood Longhorns program and as the assistant director for pre-college academic readiness in the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. Most recently, he served as a district state coordinator for the federal funded principal program. Um, also, Dr. Spikes uh, was also a teaching assistant for a course in the Department of Education and Administration 
titled Social Cultural Context of Education. Uh, his research interests focus on racial disparities in education and the practices of school districts, schools, and school leaders that serve to perpetuate and or ameliorate these disparities. In addition, he is also the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center Equity Fellow for the state of Iowa. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Spikes. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you today to talk about the work that I do with educators to create schools and classrooms that are anti-oppressive. Uh, implicit within this title uh, of the presentation is that our institutions, namely our schools, are inherently oppressive spaces. Uh, I'll be demonstrating that to you today along with explaining, with explaining how many of our educators, including myself, have allowed and are continuing to allow our institutions to be oppressive to certain groups of people. Um, these spaces, um, they promote the dominant culture's norms, values, et cetera. In essence, white privilege and male privilege and other forms of privilege are embedded within our systems. And these systems have socialized us uh, as educators in certain ways. And as a result, if we're not critically conscious of how these systems operate, then we're doomed to perpetuate negative outcomes for students. Um, currently, many of our educators are still plugged into the matrix. And I'll show you a demonstration of the matrix here in just a minute. They're not critically conscious, and it's our responsibility to go and unplug folks, folks from this matrix. Uh, but in order to unplug folks from this matrix, we first have to uh, unplug ourselves first. So our objectives for today is to first to understand the levels of oppression, to understand how we as institutional actors can serve to perpetuate or ameliorate oppressive practices due to the lack of critical consciousness. Then we'll talk about the importance of personally engaging in professional development on cultural competence and the importance of engaging our staff and organizations in this type of professional development. And we'll land a few activities that we can engage in immediately to begin our own personal journey and to begin disrupting oppressive forces within our institutions. All right, let's take a look at this clip really quickly. Uh, quickly. Some of you may have seen this, um, um, the movie The Matrix. It's actually a trilogy. This is from the first part. Uh, but if you haven't, haven't I'm going to give you a brief synopsis. This comes from Matrix 101. Um, the synopsis is this. In the near future, computer hacker Neo is contacted by underground freedom fighters who explain that reality as he understands it is actually a com complex computer simulation called The Matrix. Created by a malevolent artificial intelligence, the Matrix hides the truth from humanity, allowing them to leave, leave, excuse me, live a convincing simulated life in 1999, while machines grow and harvest people to use as an ongoing energy source. The leader of the Freedom Fighters, Morpheus, played by Lawrence Fishburne, believes Neo, who's played by Keanu Reeves, uh, is the one who will lead humanity to freedom and overthrow the machines. So let's take a look look at this clip and then we'll talk about how it relates to what we're going to be discussing today. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work. When you go to church when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all 
I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. So by virtue of you being here today, you are taking the red peel. So uh, today what we are hoping to do is to show you the world as it really is. Um, I, I like the matrix. I like this as an analogy because um, as Joyce King states, I think this system creates uh, a situation to where we develop a distorted view of reality. Um, and also as Anais Nin states, we see the world as we are, not actually as it is. So today I think what we're going to do is to take that red pill so that we can actually see how our systems operate, how our institutions actually uh, are embedded with these privileges that I spoke of earlier and how it creates situations that uh, uh, present inequitable outcomes um, um, or provide or I would say promote inequitable outcomes for all of our students. So I'm going to pose this question to you um, to get us started here. What are some factors or what do you think contributes to the academic achievement disparities and other racial disparities that uh, other racial disparities in student outcomes? And take a minute just to kind of think uh, through this. And, and it may not be um, uh, factors that you might think contribute to, to uh, these academic disparities, but what are some explanations sometimes that people give uh, as to why these disparities exist? Daniel, I see uh, Chaz thinking hard. I see Stephanie thinking hard. Okay. I see Cindy thinking hard whenever you all are ready. This is open to the floor. This is a this is a discussion. So what are some reasons for these um, academic achievement disparities and what are some explanations that people actually give as to the existence of these uh, racial disparities in student outcomes. If we're talking in general, rather than at the college level, one of the issues that I hear a lot on the reservation is the blame game, that there isn't parental support, that um, it's pretty much the self-fulfilling prophecy rather than finding out what I can do best to serve my students, it's easier to blame and say that, uh, blame it on the parents too. Okay, so. good. All right, others. What are some There's other explanations that you have heard? Yeah, I saw teacher beliefs, good. So Daniel in the chat box, um, S. Kukarni said, uh, how about teacher beliefs? Got that one. How about teacher beliefs? Thank you. Any others? I think sometimes there are lowered expectations. Lowered expectations by teachers. Okay, good. Poverty. Poverty. Some individuals think that it's cultural, that there's a cultural deficit in certain groups, and that's why they don't perform well. Okay, or cultural deficit. Good, thank you. Others? Racism. Racism. <laughs> you just flat out went there. Thank you. Absolutely. Racism. Others. Now, generally, when I go into educational spaces and I have these conversations uh, with teachers and future leaders and, and actual uh, leaders who are within these school buildings and school districts, um, I'll pose this question to them. And what I'll do is I'll go up and I'll, I'll have a chart and I'll put a line right down the middle. And on the left side of that, that chart, I'll list all of the deficit-oriented explanations that people give with regards to as to uh, why those achievement disparities exist. And it's some of the same explanations you all say that you have heard, you know, family conditions, uh, a culture of poverty, or a culture, uh, uh, some type of kind of uh, cultural deficit uh, uh, explanation. And I will list uh, all of those deficit-based uh, explanations on the left side, and I will list all the asset-based uh, explanations on the right side. 
Uh, and those asset-based uh, explanations are the explanation that actually focus on what the school might be doing to contribute uh, to these um, achievement disparities that we see. When I do that, which of those um, sides of the chart do you think is the longest whenever I finish writing down all of those explanations on the chart? The left side, all the deficit um, explanations, or the right side? The deficit. Absolutely. Uh, a majority of the time when I go into these spaces, it's always placing the blame outside of the school. Why is that problematic? The school's there to serve the public and the children. Okay, good. Absolutely. It's because it absolves us of any responsibility to actually do something to actually address the problem. And I would argue that many of our solutions uh, to addressing these achievement disparities have often focused on actually blaming outside factors, blaming the children, blaming the families, and so on, which is why, by and large, I would argue that these disparities have actually um, persisted over time. There is, uh, uh, obviously, there's a lot of research out there, a lot of scholarship out there that, that speaks to the fact that schools actually contribute to some of these dis achievement disparities that we, that we see discussed very widely. How often we don't uh, uh, focus on these as factors uh, contributing to these disparities, therefore allowing these particular achievement disparities to continue to persist. And so what we're trying to do is to, re, uh, to get our educators, to get our aspiring administrators in my particular program where I teach, uh, to actually shift their frame of thinking as to, as to how they think about uh, achievement disparities and the factors that contribute to them so that we can actually take some ownership and responsibility in addressing those particular, um, uh, those particular disparities. What that causes us to do is, first of all, to start to uh, explore um, our own biases and, and, and our own deficit orientations and to try to come up with uh, more asset-based perspectives on how to address these particular achievement gaps. Next slide. Okay, so to do so requires us really as I mentioned earlier, to become a little more critically conscious, to actually unplug ourselves from the matrix. Uh, before we do that, what I typically do is I, um, I define what oppression is, because I think oftentimes, too, we have a misunderstanding as, as to how oppression operates, how racism operates, how sexism operates. We have a pretty firm understanding of how, you know, for example, explicit overt racism operates, uh, but we don't have a really firm understanding of how uh, implicit, how covert racism operate, how covert sexism operates uh, within our particular institutions. As a matter of fact, uh, oftentimes I'll pose this question is why do these achievement disparities exist despite the fact that we have very well-intentioned folks who don't see themselves as being racist, sexist, and so forth, um, um, why do they still continue, continue to persist? It's because we have a misunderstanding of how oppression operates, how racism looks, how sexism looks, and how it operates within our systems. So let's go through these definitions very quickly. Uh, so oppression. Oppression describes a set of policies, practices, traditions, norms, definitions, and explanations which function to system systematically exploit one social group to the benefit of another social group. Now oppression here is just a blanket term that we use um, to actually talk about sexism, racism, ableism, linguicism, classism, and so on. So um, sexism, ableism, and all those other isms that I gave are just forms of oppression. So if I was to replace the word uh, uh, oppression with, let's say, the word racism, it would read like this. Racism describes the set of policies, practices, traditions, norms, definitions, and explanations which function to systematically exploit people of color to the benefit of white people. If I was to replace the word oppression with sexism, it would read like this. Sexism describes a set of policies, practices, traditions, norms, definitions, and explanations which function to systematically exploit women to the benefit of men. And so having an understanding of what racism is, having an understanding of what sex sexism is, is very important for us to be able to really understand how it operates within school. Because a lot of times, many of us think, for example, that um, that you know, white people can be, uh, excuse me, that black people can be racist uh, and that um, women can be sexist. No, that's not true uh, because we know that all the definition of 
racism and the de definition of, of sexism is prejudice plus, plus power, which suggests that you have to have the power to actually institutionalize your belief systems. And so we need to have a clear definition or clear understanding of these definitions of these isms. And let's look at what it says here at this next, um, in this next uh, part here. So depression is a viewed, uh, sorry, the next one, if you go back. Thank you. Oppression is viewed as a complex web of structures and pr processes that are pervasive in everyday life and is manifested at individual, institutional, and social and cultural levels. What I want to highlight in this particular statement or this particular quote here is the fact that it says oppression is pervasive in everyday life, which basically means it's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. It's all around us. Sexism is pervasive in everyday life. Racism is pervasive in everyday life. Ableism is pervasive in everyday life. Next slide, please. Now there are three levels of oppression. There's the individual level. And at the individual level, individual oppression are attitudes and behaviors that carry out and maintain power relationships. Institutional. Their missions, policies, organizational structures, and behaviors built into, how many does it say? All institutional systems and services. And that's important for us to note here, because what it's suggesting here is that all of those forms of oppression that I described earlier, racism, sexism, ableism, and classism, are built into all of our institutional systems and services. So our institutions include schools. So basically what it's suggesting here is, as I mentioned before, white privilege, male pri privilege, and other forms of privilege are built into all of our systems and services. Cultural and societal, their beliefs, symbols, and underlying cultural rules of behavior that teach and endorse the superiority of one group over others. Now, these aren't on the slides, but there's a handout that we've also, or that we're going to provide for you that actually goes into this a little deeper. And I want to touch on these things because it really uh, speaks to uh, how we are socialized to develop these implicit biases and so forth that lead to us perpetuating these unequal outcomes for our students. Here's what it says in the handout. At the individual level, people are socialized to accept stereotypes and internalize messages of inferiority and superiority about their own and others' social groups. The socialization of the individual is fueled by and reflects the institutional and cultural dimensions of oppression. Institutions serve as primary socializing forces in society. So that's important to consider. So our schools, they serve as primary socializing forces in society, which basically say, says that our schools actually socialize us. If we go back to that individual explanation I gave earlier, institutions socialize us to accept stereotypes and internalize messages of inferiority and superiority about their own and other social groups. And I'll talk about that in a minute and how it works. Uh, also at the institutional level, institutions produce, circulate, and maintain the dominant culture's norms, values, definitions, language, policies, and ideologies. Our ideas, views, and opinions are not objective and independent, but rather the result of myriad social messages and conditioning forces. We like the to think that our, our opinions and our preferences and so forth um, are objective and independent and that ju they just came from us, that we were born with these particular viewpoints. But basically what Cinto and D'Angelo state is, is that our preferences, our uh, views, our opinions are a result of a, a myriad social messages and conditioning forces. So basically we're consistently being socialized by these institutions uh, and we're being consistently socialized by society in general. Uh, often uh, share this joke uh, sometimes uh, when my wife and I get into an argument, sometimes I will tell you, I don't even know if I, I, I even like you. I might've just been socialized to like you. No, I'm just joking. I, I don't actually have that fight. <laughs> I don't say that when I fight with my wife. That was just a joke. Um, but anyway, I'm going to show you how this operates here in just a, a moment. But I had a question that came up. Uh, someone said, not sure I understand the concept of women or individuals can't be racist. Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, is there anybody in the, in the audience who would like to respond to that before I do? 
The concept of women or black individuals can't be racist. And just to clarify, what I said is black, uh, blacks cannot be racist or people of color cannot be racist here in the United States. And I said that women can't be sexist. That doesn't mean that they can't perpetuate racism or that they can't perpetuate sexism, right? But by definition, people of color cannot be racist and women cannot be sexist, okay? And I see a comment from Chad here, and that is correct. It's due to the fact that they lack power. As I mentioned before, um, racism or any form of ism is prejudice plus power, which suggests that you have the power to institutionalize your belief systems into policies, laws, and so on. So in this particular country uh, in general, um, women lack the power, and I'm not saying agency, but lack the power to actually institutionalize belief systems into uh, policies, laws, and so on. Same thing with people of color. They lack the power to institutionalize these beliefs and these prejudices. Okay. Daniel, may I, may I ask just a brief question? Absolutely. I, I was just curious, Chaz, Chaz if you wouldn't mind uh, enabling your mic and kind of unpacking a little bit more about, of your comment about power. I thought that was interesting. You're laughing. I'm sorry I called you out, but I'm really interested. I don't know if I have much more to say than Daniel could. Um, uh, <laughs> And hi, Chaz, by the way. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, I think he said it well. I mean, the fact that they don't, yeah, they just, they don't. Due to being in the minority, um, in that institution that exists, right, they can't, those, those changes, not those changes, um, I don't know. He said it well. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just wanted to double check. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. I don't think I can add anything. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Chaz. Okay. We can go to the next slide. All right. So I'm going to demonstrate for you how this socialization process works. And then I'm going to talk to you a little briefly after that uh, to really explain how this socialization has led to us uh, as individual educators within our institutions to allow uh, these inequities to continue to persist and to, uh, to be perpetuated. All right. So um, scratch piece of paper or something like that. Um, you can go back to the next slide. Okay. All right. On a note uh, to the previous slide where it says heroes in U.S. history. Thank you. All right. On a scratch piece of paper, what I'm going to ask you to write down is a list of names when I give you a particular category. And these names should be individuals who are largely considered to be heroes or influential figures in U.S. history. Okay. And I'm going to give you a particular category. So, for example, I might say black males. I might say white males and so on. I got this particular activity from Raymond Terrell, who works for the, the Corn Group. Uh, but, again, influential uh, figures in U.S. history. Uh, you'll have 30 seconds to come up with many, as many names as you can within those 30 seconds. And those individuals cannot be entertainers or they cannot be athletes. All right. So let's start off. You'll have 30 seconds to come up with as many names as possible in this particular category. I want you to come up with as many white male names as you can within 30 seconds. You can start now. White males who are considered to be influential figures in US history. Okay, stop. Let's hear some names. I just went with the presidents. I was <laughs> okay, started so in 1900 and I started listing all the, all the presidents. And stopped at? Obama. <laughs> there you go, all right. Any others? I saw somebody said true, president, smiley face. Einstein, Edison, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. Good, any others? I put like Salk, Polio, Good. Alexander Hamilton. Good. Any others? Okay, let's move on. Next category. Black males. You have 30 seconds. Go.
And Daniel, you had two classifications. Could you remind us it can't be a... No entertainers and no athletes. Thank you, okay. Tiffany. Thank you. Everybody was like, oh. All right, stop. Let's hear some names or see some names in the chat box. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. Of course, Frederick. Obama. Thurgood Marshall. Obama. George Washington Carver. Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall. Bayard Rustin. Good. I see MLK and Malcolm X. Any others? Okay. I put the Tuskegee Airmen. Tuskegee Airmen. Okay, good. All right. Paul Lawrence Dunbar and Langston Hughes. Paul Lawrence Dun Dunbar and Langston Hughes. Good. All right. Yep. Let's go on to the next one. All right. Latino males. I know that's redundant. Latinos. Ready? Go. Thank you. I saw Neil deGrasse Tyson. All right, stop. Okay, let's hear a few names. Castro. I'm sorry? Castro. Fidel Castro. Cesar Chavez, that's all I got. That one really was hard. Cesar Chavez, any mm -hmm. others? Guevara. I'm sorry? Hey, Guevara, isn't that his name? Hey, Guevara. Diaries. Okay. Others? Uh, Juan Felipe Herrera. Who's okay. a U.S. Poet Laureate just the past few years? I don't know if that counts as entertainer, though. Okay. Jaime Escalante. Jaime Escalante. Thank you. All right. Let's shift really quickly. All right. Now let's do black women. No entertainers or athletes. Ready? Go. All right, stop. What do you have? Sojourner Truth. Sojourner Truth. Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm. Angela Michelle. Davis. Angela Davis. Davis. I see Michelle Obama, Edelman, Phyllis Wheatley, Tubman. My Angelou. My Angelou. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Gloria Latson Billings and Kimberly Gloria. Crenshaw. All right, Gloria Latson Billings and Clem Kimberly Crenshaw. Okay, I'm running short on time, so let me go to the next category. Asian American women. Go. Yeah, and for those of you who are still staring at my screen, I, di I did say go. <laughs> I'm staring at your screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's hear a few names. I had Amy Tan, Amy but... Tan, Joy Maxine on Kingston, good. Others? Um, can't think of, cannot pronounce her last name, but Yuri, who... Uh, was involved with the Japanese internment um, and was uh, also worked with uh, Malcolm X. Yuri. Okay. All right. Last one. Native American women, and they cannot be Disney characters unless they're real. And that gets people all the time. They start thinking, and I wonder why. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, because of time, let me just hear you say some names out loud. Yeah. Or, or you can type them in our chat box. So Sacagawea, Rudolph, Lewis, and Clark. Sacagawea, good. Others? Debbie Reese. Debbie Reese. Mm -hmm. Somebody said first zero category for me. <laughs> Any others? Okay, now which of these categories was the easiest for you? White men, of course. Now, some people, I've heard sometimes people say black men, but here's something that I wanna talk about with regards to that. Whenever I do this activity and I do it throughout the country, I usually, I get a, a diversity of white men, right? From all walks of life. But when I go and I do this particular activity throughout the country, I get the same black men and they're typically civil rights leaders, right? I can actually probably have a list and I can go and I would be able to check off every name that they're gonna call when I go to this place when it comes to black men. And again, most of them are civil rights leader. I heard some other uh, good names today. Only time I usually get a different name might be when I'm outside of the state of Iowa, but you all mentioned that name today, which was George Washington Carver, right? I usually get it in Iowa, but I typically don't outside of uh, Iowa. Uh, sometimes people might say that, you know, when I do the category of white women, that, you know, that was pretty easy. But typically, again, there's something that uh, um, is a phenomenon that kind of plays out whenever I do that activity is I usually get politicians' wives, right? Usually wives of presidents and so on. Okay, now, this particular activity wasn't an activity to insult your intelligence, okay? What do you think um, our, what do you, what do you think this activity was meant to demonstrate? I, I, think, one, I think one is how, um, whether or not we're attuned to it or not, our, who, our societies broadly, but our schools more directly and our, our learning environments have particular narratives or scripts that tend to um, reinforce um, uh, narratives of particular groups of privilege over other groups. And so that in and of itself is oppressive, according to your definitions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one takeaway. Absolutely. Thank mm -hmm. you. And I see Stephanie put here shows what our institutions taught us. And that is absolutely correct. What society in general right. teaches us, what our institutions teach us. Um, if you remember when I talked about um, at the individual level earlier, it says that people are socialized to accept stereotypes and internalize messages of inferiority and superiority about their own and other social groups. So when you are in an institution that has consistently taught you that white men are are who are the are the individuals who have made American uh, Mer made America what it is today? Okay, what do you think it does for people of color to consistently be inundated with messages about the superiority or the or to be inundated with the overwhelming uh, presence of white men in their texts over um, of of um, of of these influential figures or them being, uh, I guess, presented as being influential at, uh, and there being an absence of people of color being presented in our curriculum. What do you think that's doing to our people of color? And I see someone said a fit feeling of invisibility, absolutely, right? As being not important when they're not being represented in the curriculum, right? Doing the same thing for women, right? Because again, there is a pervasiveness of men in our text. There's a pervasiveness of, of, of white men in our text. And there's an absence and underrepresentation and a misrepresentation of women and people of color in our curriculum. Now, we often look at that and we can easily identify how, that's, uh, how that creates a situation where people of color and women can feel inferior. What do you think it's doing to our white men? Making them feel um, superior. Right, making them feel superior, helping them or creating a situation to where they have an overinflated sense of self, right? But yet we call our institutions places um, that create global democratic citizens. Okay? Mm -hmm. But that's not really the case, right? We are actually creating situations to where 
people feel superior about themselves and they actually look down on other groups of people. And then you have other groups of people who have internalized uh, inferior or have this internalized inferiority complex because of what's being presented to them in these institutions. So again, going back to what we stated earlier, people are being socialized within these institutions to accept stereotypes and internalize messages of inferiority. And this is not just happening in our school. So if you look at the next few slides that I have, so Cesar, if you would, wouldn't mind. Now let's look here. Now we have here a picture of LeBron James, right? Who is being really compared to who? King Kong. King Kong, who is a primate, a monkey, right? And most of us probably know the cultural stereotype, right? Black people being monkeys. And for those of you who don't know how that stereotype originated, I would encourage you to watch a documentary called Race the Power of an Illusion, episode one. It kind of speaks to the, uh, the derivation of that particular stereotype. But there's also some gender issues here as well. But again, these are messages that are being consistently perpetuated in the media. And some people will look at this and say, well, LeBron's a black man, right? Well, again, we're all part of this system that has socialized us. So LeBron might not be knowing what he's perpetuating by allowing himself to be presented in this particular way. All right, let's look at the next slide. All right, what we have here are two uh, particular stories that ran in the Associated Press. Um, and I just, we just, you know, they, they come side by side like this, but these are actually two different stories. Uh, and let's look at the picture and then the captions beside the picture. And let's look at the differences between them. All right. So what we have in that first picture is what appears to be uh, a young black person. I think they later found out it was a young woman, not a, a young man. But let's look at the, the caption beside that picture at the top. It says a young man walks through chest deep floodwaters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. Now let's look at the next picture, what appears to be two white people. And let's see how, I'm sorry, go back. And let's read the caption. It says, two residents wade through chest deep waters finding bread and soda from a local grocery store after Hurricane Katrina came through the area in New Orleans. Now, that's pretty stark, right? And again, these are just, these are images, uh, representative images, but there are Im images like this are pervasive throughout uh, our society, right? They're pervasive throughout our media, right? Movies present people of color in certain way and pre present white people in certain way. They present women in certain way and men in certain way. They present people based upon social class in one way. So again, this speaks to the fact that culturally, uh, institutionally, we're being socialized to accept these messages, these stereotypes about certain groups of people, okay? And there's a lot of research that speaks to the fact that that socialization process is actually impacting our behaviors. It impacts the way we think about things and thus impacts the ways in which we actually develop policies and the ways in which we interact with students within our schools and so on. So what does that mean? Because we recognize that these institutions and these, society, uh, these, um, these societal levels of oppression have been consistently socializing us all of our lives and that we do uh, have these uh, implicit biases because that has also been proven that we have these implicit biases and so on. We have to first acknowledge that first, right? And then once we acknowledge it, then we can do something to counter it, okay? Once we can uh, do things to counter it, then we then we can actually um, uh, create situations in our classrooms and in our school buildings to where we're actually uh, better meeting the needs of our students. One more poster, if you look here, oftentimes, again, this is why it's important for us to be critically conscious. So if you look at the next slide, um, I had, I had a, uh, an aspiring superintendent who came to me one day and he said he would not have been aware of this had he not gone through his own con cultural competency training. But he went into some classrooms and, and he looked in one of the classrooms and all of the representations of scientists and mathematicians uh, on posters were of white people, right? And that sends a message to our students. That sends them, uh, and it, it's a very subliminal message. And this is something that we have to pay attention to, even when we're not explicitly saying things, right? Or explicitly doing things, right? Students are still learning even in the absence of things. So if there is absence of the representation of people of color and so on, um, then um, it sends a message again to our students who are in that particular class. 
Um, I had a comment here. Your instruction to not list athletes and entertainers along with these images shows an implicit bias that the population majority groups are societally gifted with intelligence and work ethic. Good point, thank you. All right, um, let's take the, uh, the next slide. Now, all forms of oppression operate both overtly and covertly. Overt oppression is easier to identify, but covert oppression is not. So that's why we, we're spending a lot of time to talk about the socialization process and again, how we have developed uh, these implicit biases and so forth, how they operate, because it's important for us to recognize them so that we can again, as I mentioned earlier, do something about them. Covert racism includes all those institutional policies and practices whose habitual outcome is in equitable relationships between whites and people of color, even when race is not an explicit or even an intended factor. And as is said, racism is not about intent, it's about outcomes. Okay, next. All right, so what can we do to ensure or to work towards creating more anti-oppressive spaces? What can we do to create schools that are more anti-oppressive? As I mentioned before, uh, the this, this aspiring uh, superintendent that I mentioned earlier, he said he wouldn't have not been able to recognize some of these things if he had not engaged in some cultural competency training uh, to help to develop his critical consciousness. So it's important for us to engage in professional development on cultural competency. It's important for us to engage our staff, uh, if we are school leaders, in professional development on cultural competency. Uh, it's important to consider the following things when you think about the right type of PD to offer around cultural competency. First, how they define cultural competency. You should also choose sessions that take an inside-out approach, basically making sure that individuals work with themselves first, help them to see that they are cultured, uh, cultured and racialized beings. Uh, also, you want to uh, get them involved in a, a PD that centers race in the conversations because far too often uh, we actually um, don't engage in that racial conversation. We actually try to say, well, it's about social class, it's about that, and we don't really uh, engage in a deep conversation ab about race when it's very uh, apparent that uh, many of our disparities in our educational outcomes are along racial lines, okay? Also, some important uh, empowering practices that we can engage in immediately um, with our own staffs and, our, uh, and within our schools and so on, is that we can uh, leverage things like cultural artifacts. I, have, I often use this activity um, in order to not only allow spaces for people to um, come to terms with the fact that they also have a culture, right? But it also uh, provides an opportunity for uh, relationship and trust building, right? It also allows an opportunity for me to learn more about. So if I'm a classroom teacher or if I'm a school leader, uh, it gives me an opportunity to learn about the various uh, stakeholders within my organization. So again, if I'm a classroom teacher, I might do this activity to learn more about the students who are present in my classroom so that I can incorporate some of their cultural beliefs and some of their cultural traditions and so forth in the curriculum that I teach right but again as I said too, it allows a space too for us to come to terms with who we are as individual people because the more we become cognizant of our social identities the more we become cognizant of how those social identity connects to these larger systems the better we are uh, and able to be able to um, to counteract uh, these forces that serve to um, perpetuate these unequal outcomes that we see within our school systems Another thing that we can engage in is incorporating equity audits and also engaging in your own learning. I would advise that you look at uh, work by Sherrick Skirla and McKenzie and also by Fatura and Capper. Uh, what it focus, what it again, it, it, what it uh, forces us to do or encourages us to do is to start looking at what the system might be doing to create these inequitable outcomes rather than focusing on what the students are not doing or what the students don't have or what the students aren't bringing to the table. It focuses on what are we doing to create these unequal outcomes. It starts, it makes us look at, for example, uh, how many of our students are in advanced classes who are people of color? How many of our people uh, who come from what we would consider to be low socioeconomic backgrounds? how many of them have access to rigorous courses and so on. So 
Uh, I would encourage you to engage in that equity audit process because again, it helps to highlight some of the inequitable structures that are present in our school, but it also helps to sharpen our lens, as I mentioned earlier, to start to see that we as, a, as, as institutions and we as actors within these institutions are actually serving to perpetuate some of these unequal outcomes uh, that we see persistent within our school buildings. Uh, to engage in your own learning, you can also um, engage in book studies. Uh, I would, I would um, encourage you as a staff um, uh, within your organization to read a couple of uh, texts. One is, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Another one is Teaching, Learning, Anti-Racism by Lewis Derman Sparks and Carol Brunson Phillips. Those are, those are two books that I started with on my own journey. Another book is called, Is Everyone Really Equal? Um, it's actually a book that our staff has engaged in here at Iowa State, the School of Education faculty and staff. We started to read that text so that we can have conversation about op oppression and how it operates. Um, and then again, engaging in your own development. Some of the things that you can do is engage in those readings that I provided there at an individual, uh, on an individual basis, uh, along with uh, many other texts that I would be happy to um, to, uh, to, refer, uh, to refer you to, um, and watch some of the documentaries uh, that are out there that speak to some of this stuff. One that I would highly encourage is what I mentioned earlier, Race, the Power of an Illusion. It's a three-part series, episode one, episode two, and episode three. I think each of those episodes are between 50 minutes to an hour. Uh, and then there's another um, documentary that I would highly recommend. It's called Misrepresentation. It talks about the representation of women in the media. And again, speaking to, again, how, these, um, uh, how the media and these other uh, institutions socialize us to, again, accept these stereotypes about certain groups of people. So in uh, concluding thoughts, I like this quote here and actually um, all of these quotes here, but the first two are by Jones and Nichols. Uh, the first one says, in education in general, the significance of knowing self in an educative, educative setting or educative setting is viewed as critical toward the effort to know students. And that's why I was saying earlier that it's important for us to engage in professional development that starts or that utilizes that inside out approach. We need to get to know ourselves first. We need to know ourselves as racialized beings. We need to know ourselves as culture beings first because the way in which the system is set up, it really creates a situation to where when we hold a particular dominant social identity, it is often invisible to us, right? And as a result, we don't see the, um, when we experience the world, for example, through that social identity, we don't see that as experiencing it through that particular cultural identity. We see it as, as, as a normal experience. What we have to do, as I mentioned earlier from that Anais Nin quote, we have to recognize that we see the world as we are not as it is, right? So the ways in which we experience the world is largely based upon our racial and cultural identities. So it's important for us to come to terms with that because then once we become to terms with that, then we can be in a better place to be able to uh, do what's right for our students. I like this next quote here. Educators must constantly ask themselves, does who I am contribute to the underachievement of students who are not like me? And then as I've said all along, we argue that in order to improve the schooling experiences for students of color, educators must become more culturally proficient. We must become critically conscious. We must unplug ourselves from the matrix. We must lift that wool that has been over our eyes so that we can improve the outcomes of our students. Once we unplug ourselves from the matrix, then it's our responsibility to unplug others from the matrix, others within our institutions, uh, others within our school staff, so again, so that we can effectively meet the needs of all of our students. Thanks so much, Daniel. We've got two questions before I wrap up uh, from Todd and Sarah. They're in the chat box. The first, I'll read them back. If you wouldn't mind kind of bundling them together as much as possible sure. with the two minutes we have remaining. The first is, do you think having staff read one of these books, the books you were referencing or others? Um, let's see here, I just lost it. Our chat box moved. Let's see, my apologies. Oh, I just uh, just popped up here for me. My apologies. Do you think having staff read one of these books or others can be useful even before PD? Or would you yeah. recommend incorporating a book study after um, some foundations built? And then Todd's question kind of connects with that. He feels that white educators feel racist when they intentionally try to incorporate these practices. 
Um, however, he feels like that white educators, uh, he said we, uh, have to be intentional about, about it to address the issues. How do we resolve that? So putting those two together, how would you, how would you respond to Todd and Sarah? Yeah, so um, I guess the first question as it relates to um, the, the PD and the book study, I would per perhaps recommend that if you're gonna engage in a book study prior to PD, I would recommend a book study like, is everyone really equal, right? And if you engage in that book study, uh, or, or even why are the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria, I wouldn't recommend teaching and learning anti-racism uh, prior to engaging in PD. But if you choose to engage in PD first, then any of those books would be actually sufficient. My recommendation would be at this point, if I had to choose one or, or the other, um, I would actually um, engage in PD first and then give them um, uh, the book, um, Is Everyone Really Equal? Or Why Are All the Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria to continue their learning or to actually supplement their learning as, as a part of the PD. Um, and for those of you who might, again, consider offering PD to your organization, I would encourage you perhaps to even read the books first because I would want you to choose, again, PD that's aligned with some of the concepts that are presented in those texts because I think those texts really speak to the, thing, uh, the concepts and the ways in which I talk about them and the ways in which I presented them here today. Uh, I think many white educators feel racist when they intentionally try to incorporate these practices. However, we have to be intentional about uh, it to address these issues. How do we resolve that? Um, I think this comes back to, again, helping um, us to really understand what racism is and how it actually operates, right? I think in order for us to really address um, these inequitable outcomes for students, how to address these racial disparities, we have to be comfortable in engaging um, in um, intentional and targeted practices. We have to be comfortable in our own skin as, and I say our own skin, um, but in your own skin as white people, right? You, and that's why I said uh, uh, earlier, um, it's important for us to engage in this in this inside out approach, not to deny you know your 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 social identities, not to discard yourself for, of your social identities, but actually to embrace that social identity and the power that's actually attached to those particular identities, so that you can help others progress, so that you can help to provide uh, equitable opportunities for others so that you can help to tear down structures and barriers. And the more you become comfortable with that and understanding how op oppression works, I think you will be less likely to feel racist, less likely to feel um, uh, guilty, so to speak, uh, but be empowered to, uh, to embrace an anti-racist identity, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Todd and Sarah and everyone for your, for your, really rich questions. The chat box has been very, very active. I also want to thank um, all the participants in today's Equilearn uh, virtual roundtable, creating anti-oppressive spaces, our roles as institutional, institutional actors. We want to also provide a special, special thanks to Dr. Spikes. Thank you so very much for taking the time to share a bit more about yourself. Uh, uh, really um, strategic jokes you tell to your wife or that you don't tell to your wife a little bit about uh, your research and approaches and practices that we all can cultivate and or continue to ensure anti-oppressive school communities. In addition, we wanna point out uh, two of our resources from the Midwest and Plains Equity Assistance Center. The first that you see on your screen is the Equity Dispatch title, Reframing the Achievement Gap, ensuring all students benefit from equitable access to learning. Uh, in this issue, we rethink how the quote unquote achievement gap is conceptualized uh, by moving away from describing the achievement gap as a persistent disparity of educational measures between groups of students defined by race, ethnicity, and class, and gender, to understanding it as the outcome of historical and intergenerational marginalization of students of color and students living in disinvested communities. We also want to highlight another one of our center tools, our anti-harassment policy review tool. This tool contains recommendations for reviewing anti-discrimination, anti-harassment, and anti-bullying policies. Um, the recommendations or requirements are derived directly from agreements between the Office of Civil Rights and or Department of Justice with real school districts and may be considered basic guidelines for protecting students and families' rights through school and district policies. Uh, finally, we wanna also encourage you to visit our website. Uh, Nick is gonna post that in the chat box. 
www.greatlakesequity.org to access further tools and resources, such as our virtual equity library, our monthly equity dispatch publications, and our equity spotlight podcast series. Um, you can also access all materials on our website as well as stay abreast of upcoming events via our 2016-2017 calendar events. And in closing, we want to ask for two to three minutes of your time as we wrap up uh, to complete the post-session questionnaire. Nick has posted that in the chat box. He'll repost that. If you all wouldn't mind taking two to five minutes to complete that post-session questionnaire, I see some of you are in cars or in classrooms and to the extent that you have mobile devices and you're able to complete that post-session questionnaire, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, we are an organization of continuous improvement, and so having your feedback is very, very important to us. With that, we are exactly at time. Again, we want to thank you, and a special thanks to Dr. Daniel Spikes, and we look forward to engaging with you all in the future. Have a great day. Thank you.